So, uh, welcome to the next lecture in early German prose, where we more or less continue directly from where we left in uh, week two, namely in the printing center of Augsburg. And I'd uh, shown when we looked at the Tristan publications how uh, vernacular printing uh, moved from the kind of experimental stage to the business stage. By about 1480, printing was breaking even. So up to then, uh, it was a a uh, leap harbor uh, business, so you would invest in buying a nicely printed book, but the cheaper version was uh, just to copy it by hand. But by uh, 1480, um, the printers had established how to make a profit, which topics would sell and how many woodcuts you had to invest to make it uh, viable and uh, so on. So I'd they each picked uh, different stories. So we had seen Anton Zorg picked the Tristan, and uh, Johann Schönsberger, a slightly younger printer, then picked up only the Tristrand in 1498 after uh, Anton Zorg had died, um, and focused instead of another um, best-selling topic, a courtly um, area, um, the story of Pontus and Sidonia. And um, uh, Schönsberger was trying to find the unique selling point for his story by highlighting how uh, actually he had come by the topic, and that uh, was by royal commission, as it were. So um, before the story starts with es was vor Zeiten gar ein frommer, gütiger und wohltuender König, so the same type of fairy tale entry that we had seen for the Tristran story, um, he has a short preface which focuses on the points um, he obviously thought would sell uh, the story. He hebt sich an ein schöne Historie. Daraus und davon man viel guter, schöner Lehre und Unterweisung und Gleichnuss mag nehmen. So, um, the first thing to uh, promote is that it's actually a didactic uh, text, so you can learn something. It's not, um, you might uh, buy it for entertainment, but you kind of, uh, it's, can, you can von, von der Steuer absetzen as educational um, textbook. Und besonder die Jungen, so sie hören und vernehmen die Guttat und groß Ehre und Tugend, so ihr Eltern und Vorderen getan und an ihn gehabt haben. So he defines history, we had seen this term already with a fear historian, as something from the past that informs uh, the presence. And um, so he, he doesn't emphasize uh, uh, the dragons and so on that uh, were emphasized in, in Tristan, but rather that it's um, uh, edutainment uh, based on historical facts. Welche Historie, die durch leuchtig und hochgeboren Frau, Frau Eleonora, geborene Königin aus Schottenland, Erzherzogin zu Österreich, löblich von französischer Zungen in Deutsch getransferiert und gemacht hat. So, um, translation uh, uh, as a transfer, really um, taking the basic meaning of translation, namely to ferry across, so transferre, originally in Latin means to bring something from one shore to another shore. And so literally by coming from Scotland, um, of course, uh, which language would have been spoken at court in Scotland? 
French, exactly. So uh, somebody who was well versed in the educated language of uh, that, uh, the, the courtly language of that period, and through marriage um, transferred herself and uh, the topics um, as seen in Scotland brought to uh, Austria. And uh, it claims that she actually uh, took to translating what she presumably had enjoyed reading uh, dem durchleuchtigen hochgeborenen Fürsten und Herren, Herren Siegmunden Erzherzog zu Österreich und ihrem ehelichen Gemahl zu lieb und zu gefallen. So, um, it's very uh, prominent that uh, women are the people who negotiate between the languages spoken within Europe. And that um, actually was part of, yeah, she, I, I thought she was incredibly ugly, but then I, I looked at other portraits, uh, and, uh, actually a self-portrait by this Anton Boyce or Anton Weiss, and uh, he has exactly the same uh, chubby cheeks and uh, a kind of uh, um, like pumpkin head uh, that he paints here for, and it seems to have been fashionable because he was traveling with commissions uh, across the Netherlands and um, France and Germany and Austria. Um, had made really an international career out of it. Uh, he, he certainly specialized in painting all the jewelry uh, nicely. And uh, then all the patrician women wanted to be portrayed by the same person who had painted the princesses and duchesses and, and so on. So um, uh, Eleanor of Scotland was part of a, a noble elite of multilingually educated women. So they normally would be betrothed at a very early age, then sent to the court of their future husband to be educated uh, there in the uh, language of the country. Um, we have uh, private letters from Eleanor. Uh, I know that she was certainly uh, very eloquent and fluent in French, her German letters actually uh, look much less polished. So it can be assumed that she probably had a help from a secretary at court, but um, it was much uh, more efficient for a blurb if you could claim it to be directly translated by her than if you uh, credited the ghostwriter, as it were. And um, so she was the daughter of uh, James I of uh, Scotland and uh, Joan Beaufort. So her mother actually was a French native speaker who had been sent to Scotland. And uh, in a similar way, um, Elizabeth of Laurent Vaudemont um, was married and sent early to Nassau Saarbrücken. So Saarbrücken, uh, very close to the French border and naturally still bilingual region. And she actually started a fashion for translating French uh, stories. Uh, there was a very high demand, uh, kind of bestsellers of uh, the day into uh, German and particularly looking at a chanson de jest. So uh, a very uh, much uh, sex and crime stories uh, with uh, lots of battles going on. Um, and uh, a similar background actually to the Pontus uh, and Sidonia story, going back to um, 
the era of uh, Charlemagne and uh, the like the chanson de uh, Roland, um, the topics she translated. And um, the, uh, these women corresponded among each other and copied fashion um, both in uh, dress and in reading matter. So uh, uh, the Margaret of Savoy, uh, uh, who was married three times, first to uh, the king of Jerusalem, but he died, uh, a Frenchman, before uh, they actually had met in person. So she had been married by proxy. And then when she was traveling to meet him, he had been fighting in Sicily. Uh, he died on the way. So um, uh, the Italian court poet where she was when she uh, had to stop because her husband had died, said she was vedova primo che sposa. Uh, she was widowed before she even had been uh, properly uh, married. Um, then she was married to the Count of the Palatine, uh, Ludwig, uh, residing in Heidelberg. And when uh, he died, uh, she married... Um, <coughs> Count Ulrich uh, the Fifth of Württemberg. So she was um, related twice to Mechthild of the Palatinate, uh, Palatinate who uh, actually came from the uh, Pfalz and then married um, the brother of Ulrich uh, the Fifth. And we have a lot of correspondence between them. Uh, um, advising each other on what books to buy or to commission. Um, because um, in this uh, starting era of print, possessing manuscript actually became a status symbol. So Margaret of Savoy commissioned um, illuminated manuscripts of uh, the topics she had read as a child, because she had been raised also French-speaking, Savoy, um, French-speaking era. A fun fact about her is that she is probably the only legitimate pope's daughter of history, because her father uh, became pope as Felix V after he had been widowed. But then uh, Savoy was pretty poor, and he had to pawn his tiara to get the dowry for her to marry the Count of uh, the Palatinate. And so when uh, the Count of the Palatinate died, but her father needed his tiara back, um, the, her relatives in Heidelberg claimed all of her French and German manuscripts um, as... Um, part payment of uh, the dowry that hadn't been forthcoming from her father, the Pope. So uh, books became a player also in the kind of European uh, marriage uh, market. And that was the reason why she commissioned new manuscripts in Stuttgart. And uh, so she commissioned an illustrated uh, manuscript of uh, Pontus and Sidonia, which then served as a model for uh, the people doing the woodcuts for the first uh, printed edition. And we'll see some of the similarities, um, but also how, how to make a story uh, look um, high status. Um, these uh, women uh, acted as uh, translators sometimes, uh, like Eleanor and Elizabeth, but uh, also very important as uh, patronesses uh, of uh, the arts. So um, Mechthild is uh, a co-founder of Tübingen University, uh, 
and was actually more learned than her son Eberhard uh, Embald. And um, she financed um, a lot of translators. And if you are uh, ever interested in different translation principles, it's worthwhile comparing translations by her two clerks, Niklas von Wieler and Heinrich Steinheuel, uh, one of them trying to be extremely literal, and the other, um, Niklas von Wieler, and the other Steinheuel trying to have a, to develop more an idiomatic um, type for translating Boccaccio stories, for example, into German via Latin. So um, behind the Pontus story is a network of noble uh, women, and that echoes actually the geography of uh, the story. This isn't the geography of Pontus and Sidonia. Um, I couldn't find an a exact uh, one for that, I, and my uh, map drawing skills are not very well developed, but uh, I thought it would be interesting to compare it with a map of the Tristan, uh, because in many respects it's a similar picture, just uh, that the map of Pontus and Sidonia is slightly further south. So Pontus is the son um, of the king of Galicia, who travels to uh, the Bretagne um, trying to escape uh, the attacking Saracens. And then from there, um, he travels further to uh, England. And um, the reason why these realms overlap is that behind uh, the uh, Pontus story, there is an Anglo-Norman chanson de geste, Horn at Riemenhild, uh, from the late 12th century, uh, which uh, talked about uh, the um, Muslim um, uh, conquista of Spain and uh, Galician and turned this into uh, a novel uh, form. And uh, the French version from circa 1400 was written, written by a French count who took the basic storyline and um, added, on the one hand, fairy tale elements um, and a happy ending, which a chanson de geste uh, not always has. And on the other hand, he added in lots of local color from French nobility. So he makes all the... Um, uh, Counts um, and noblemen who fight together with Pontus uh, to uh, rescue Spain and France and England actually from the invading Saracens, um, members of the uh, noble families in the Bretagne. Um, I don't know whether any of you have studied Melusine uh, for paper six that has a similar um, enriching of an uh, older story with uh, name-dropping of the noble families around uh, uh, the author. So uh, uh, Geoffrey de la Tour Landry, who uh, wrote this Pontus et la Belle Sidonie, Sidonie um, uh, used uh, this recognizable structure to... Uh, praise and celebrate his uh, 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 friends and family around uh, the Bretagne. And uh, the basic storyline is uh, there is uh, the Zoltan um, who has four sons and he sends out the four sons and challenges them. So the oldest son uh, is uh, allowed to uh, is the, his designated successor, and he says um, the second most uh, heritage will be given to the, uh, that of the remaining three sons, 
who uh, slays most Christians and conquers most of um, Europe. So um, the first one sets out and conquers uh, Galicia. The second one then tries to uh, conquer uh, the Bretagne, and the third one tries to conquer England. And um, Pontus is uh, the son of the king of Galicia and still a boy when the f first Zoltan's son attacks, so he flees to the Bretagne. Then uh, he slays uh, the Zoltan's son who comes to uh, conquer the Bretagne, uh, then goes over to England when they are attacked, slays there the Sultan's son, and then uh, finally it ends with him returning to his original kingdom, Spain, and uh, slaying there uh, the Sultan's son. And um, you see as uh, opening image for this illuminated manuscript for Margaret of uh, Savoy, uh, the a ship setting out to conquer Galicia, and that's uh, the same you know, uh, ship image that you see in the German version. While the uh, French version focuses right from the start on the love story. So uh, the French version says, Si commence une excellente histoire, histoire laquelle fait molt à nos terres du très veillante Roé Pontus, fils de Roé de Galice et de la belle Sidoine, fille de Roé de Bretagne. So here starts an excellent uh, story um, which uh, has much, uh, many things of note about the very valiant uh, King Pontus, uh, the son of the King of Galicia, and about uh, the uh, beautiful Saint Juan, the daughter of the King of Bretagne. So uh, you have quite a different take on how to frame the story from the educational focus that the Augsburg printer uh, does, who uh, focuses on it being an, a historical story and an educational story and not a uh, love story. Um, the, um, uh, there was obviously um, a demand for this type of material. So on the left-hand side, you see the first edition, which only survives in one and a half copy. Uh, the only complete copy is actually in the British Library. Um, and then um, on the right-hand side, you see uh, the second edition two years later. You see the... Um, they kept uh, the format, which obviously had uh, worked uh, well. They kept uh, the big woodcut initial E for Es was for Zeiten. Um, they replaced uh, the smaller initial on the top, the left hand of the H, for he hebt sich an, um, either because... Uh, the other one had been worn out or it was actually too distracting to have a ornate uh, other initial on the top rather than just a straightforward um, black letter uh, form. And um, if you uh, put side by side just uh, the actual spelling, you see uh, which variants were interchangeable between for, for early modern printers because it was certainly the second edition typeset from a, a copy of the first edition. And uh, none of the changes are actually significant in any content sense. Um, 
except perhaps for the very last line where in the first edition says, ihrem ehelichen Gemahl zu lieb und zu gefallen, um, that is changed in the second edition, zu lieb und wohl uh, gefallen, which uh, might make a more pleasing prose cadenza, but it might uh, also simply be a uh, misreading. So how this normally would work in a workshop would be that there would be a dictator, somebody who would have uh, the, a model, either a manuscript or, in this case, the first edition, and would read out to the typesetter. Um, to uh, so, and the typesetter would typeset along. Um, so um, this explains the different spellings because the typesetter doesn't uh, look up and down constantly, thinking, "How do I spell daraus with a sz or a normal s?" But uh, just spelling how he heard it being um, read out. Uh, I'd, uh, you see that in the second edition there are even a couple of probably typos. So in this line here, Frau, Frau Eleonora, geborene Königin aus Schottenland, this becomes Frau Eleonora, geparne Königin aus Schottenland, um, which probably was just a uh, mishandled uh, letter case. Um, you can see that uh, the typesetters tended to uh, settle for certain spellings. So um, here you have Herren, Ian Hochgeboren and Fürst und Herren, Herren Siegmunden, both times spelled with a single R. Here in the second edition you have Fürsten und Herren, Herren Siegmunden, um, both with a double R. So it's not a difference in spelling, it's just uh, once the, he has uh, settled for one form. Uh, the, similarly, um, you have here Erzherzogin and Erzherzog spelled with TZs. Erzherzog, um, uh, but not completely consistent. So here you have Erz with T and Herzogin with CZ. Uh, and then here Erz, Herzog, both times TZ. Here you have uh, consistently CZ, Erz, Herzogin and Erz Herzog, but um, uh, and you, here you have a, a slightly better reading, getransferiert instead of getransferiert, which is probably also a typo. What is curious is that uh, there is one typo repeated, namely, uh, die Tugend so ihre Eltern und fordern getan, so fordern as in uh, another word for forefaren, those who were uh, previous early, and that was typeset as fordern, um, and perhaps the dictator uh, didn't realize what was meant and read out fordern, uh, because uh, in the second edition it's spelled like that, but it's then corrected in the third edition, which was published in 1498. Uh, there you see um, die Guttat und große Ehre und Tugend so ihre Eltern und fordern getan. Uh, there um, the reading makes sense. But uh, the really exciting thing about uh, the 1498 uh, edition is that this is, um, as far as we know, the first uh, title page uh, in, in history. So um, 
in all the previous editions of vernacular stories, the story started just with this uh, blurb or with a, uh, in, in the Vier Historien, which are, uh, have been just circulating, it starts just with a woodcut. Then you have this uh, short printer's preface explaining what is going to happen, so a short um, Inhaltsangabe. And um, here you have something that uh, works as a proper title page, even though it's s still somewhere halfway between um, a blurb and a short title as we would uh, use it. So um, this reads, Das Buch und löbliche Historie von dem edlen Königssohn aus Galicia, genannt Pontus, auch von der schönen Sidonia, Königin aus Britannia, welche Historie gar lustig und gar kurzweilig zu hören ist. So other aspects of the story are here stressed um, in comparison with the original blurb. So it's not longer praised as being particularly educational, but rather as entertaining. Uh, kurzweilig, meaning die, uh, die lange Weile abkürzen, so that uh, instead of uh, uh, taking a long time, uh, your, um, it whiles away the time in a sh uh, shorter and more um, uh, enjoyable fashion, <laughs> lustig. Uh, and a pet, um, if you look closely, you can see The font is a different one from uh, the font used for the main body of the text. It's a larger um, title font. And it's one, if you look at the Vier Historien, that is used for folio editions of liturgical books. And that's the reason why you have the peculiar spellings for Ws, because Since it, uh, this um, Auszeichnungsschrift is taken from a Latin context, it didn't have any Ws. So uh, the uh, printer typeset it by combining a round R with a V, uh, making up um, the Ws as, as he went along. And that, if you remember, was... Uh, a similar issue for um, Pfister, the first vernacular printer who just had the Bible uh, type phase. Um, so um, the illuminated manuscript that uh, Margarete von Savoy commissioned um, Uh, is funnily enough partly inspired by the woodcut aesthetics of the period, um, but um, focuses on uh, heavily on color and uh, on details that would stress the courtly uh, nature of uh, this. But um, The figures aren't giving, given any individual features. Uh, they all have blonde locks. Uh, it's kind of unisex haircut uh, round uh, the ears. Um, and um, they all, all uh, the uh, courtly, uh, courtiers have uh, pointed shoes, which were very fashionable in the 1480s, they tended to be so long that you had to have a chain at the top uh, which you are then fastened to your belt so that you wouldn't fall over um, your shoes. Uh, if any of you have been in Nuremberg and seen the Brunnenhanse there, uh, um, he has this uh, chain to his belt to keep up the tip of his uh, shoes. Uh, they um, all have uh, uh, something that uh, is 
showing off the waistline. Um, it's a, a period uh, when uh, buttons had been established, which was uh, the big revolution in medieval fashion, because it meant uh, if you can button up your uh, shirt, you can make it more figure-hugging than if you have to get everything over your head. Um, although these aren't buttoned at the tops, but rather with a... Um, uh, a string, uh, cross string uh, pulled together. And uh, very tight fitting uh, stockings, also uh, fashionable. And um, one fun uh, fact about the manuscript is, or a fun aspect rather, is uh, that um, Pontus is always shown wearing a crown, but a lot of the plot line hinders on him being very cleverly disguised. So he is dressing up as a wild man or dressing up as a beggar to get uh, to the uh, courts. Um, so he is doing in the story everything not to be recognized, but uh, <laughs> the reader uh, um, has the advantage about, uh, over the figures of the story that they can always recognize him by his uh, crown, which he's wearing even in bed. Uh, so when in his wedding night, he's still featured uh, uh, the crown. So for uh, Marguerite who commissioned it, it seems to have been more important to have a, a good-looking prince uh, than for the disguise to work, at least uh, for her. Um, and uh, there are a number of weddings taking place in the story. The first one is Pontus and Sidonia, and then uh, Pontus uh, goes over to England to fight the, th uh, the second, third, uh, son of uh, the Soldan. Uh, and meanwhile, um, his uh, counselor, whom he had entrusted, Sidonia, takes over uh, power and um, uh, tells everything everywhere the false tale that Pontus is dead and that he is going to marry now the, uh, the beautiful uh, Sidonia. Um, and uh, Pontus only comes back uh, at the nick of time uh, to uh, at the um, Hochzeits uh, feast and slays uh, the um, evil Genelun um, and then returns to England uh, where the daughter of the, the English princess actually wanted to marry him as well and marries her off to his cousin. So you have uh, two good weddings and one wrong wedding in the um, story. And um, the um, printer in Augsburg used uh, this as a kind of structuring device. So he used the same uh, woodcut um, every time uh, there was uh, the story um, of a wedding, whether it's uh, the wrong one as in the right-hand side image of Sidonia being forced to marry Genelun. Genelun, anybody recognizes by chance the name? Uh, Genelon as well. Um, he is taking over from the Chanson de Roland, uh, where he is uh, the traitor. So um, the original story is uh, recharged with courtly names, uh, which applies also to um, the names on, uh, at the English court, because the daughter of the King of England is called Genefe, which is uh, actually a form of uh, Ginovere, so um, uh, King Arthur's uh, wife. 
And um, I thought I would uh, just give you a bit of a read through of the uh, final uh, sequence of the story because um, it uh, shows very well how the story is uh, embedded in a, a new form of nearly sentimentality. So uh, they weep and kiss all the time uh, and sigh and uh, uh, blush. And um, so this is up to, um, on the one hand. On, on the other hand, um, there's a much uh, moral uh, value judgment put in. But it, it's um, quite well written and obviously went down very well. So um, um, Pontus uh, returns to the English court after having killed off the Soldan's uh, son. And the queen greets him and she nahm ihn in ihre Arm und küsst ihn und empfing ihn mit großer Ehre. Und die Königin forschet in, uh, wie es ihm seither ergangen wäre. Und er sprach wohl von den Gnaden Gottes. So uh, he doesn't claim um, the victory for himself, but attributes it to uh, the grace of God. Genefe Augen waren alle Weg auf Polydus ob sie ihn mocht gesehen. So Polydus is the uh, cousin of Pontus and he has said he'll bring him over for her to, um, uh, as a substitute, um, since he can't marry her, since he is already married, but uh, she might like Polydus as well. So she's uh, watching whether she uh, could uh, see Pontus. Dazu sie große Begierd hat. Und am letzten erkennet sie ihn bei Pontus, uh, seinem Vetter, wann er ihm etwas gleich sah. So he looks uh, like his uh, cousin and so she recognizes him. Er gefiel ihr gar wohl und gedaucht sie fast hübsch und wohl kühn uh, sein. Aber doch, dass sie es wahrlich noch wissen, ob er es wäre, doch forschet sie den Herzogen von Gollester. So, Gollester, Gloucester. Uh, der bei ihr do Stunde und sagt ihr, wer er wär. Und sie gedacht ihr in ihrem Herzen, sie hätt doch nit gefehlt, ihn zu erkennen. Wann ihr Herz sagt ihr's wohl. So her heart has told her who her chosen one is. Um, danach, do es Essenszeit war und was und ginge nu zu Tisch, Du ward ihn gar köstlich gedient mit Speise und die mächtigen Freien dienten desselbigen Tags persönlichen durch des Königs Befehl nus. So normally uh, the meal would be served by the servants, but to uh, give particular splendor uh, at the English court, um, all the dukes are um, serving as uh, to, uh, uh, as food uh, deliverer. Danach äh, pracht man Wein und trieset. Genefe, des Königs Tochter, hätt groß Begier, dass man red von ihren Sachen. Sie sprach zum König von Schotten in Schimpfsweis, »Ich weiß, was aus den Sachen wird, das der Grafe von Rischemund an hat bracht.« Der König lacht und sprach zu ihr, »Ihr habt ihn wohl gesehen. Was ratend ihr dazu? Gefällt er euch wohl?« Du ward sie schamrot und sprach, was mein Herr und Vater und ihr mit mir schaffte, will ich gehorsam sein. Du verstunde er wohl, dass es ihr gefallen wär's, was. Und ging zu dem König von Engeland und sprach zu ihm, es wäre an der Zeit, dass man red von der Heirat seiner Mumen. Du sprach der König von Engeland, ihr rat wohl. Der König von Schottland hieß ingehen in sein Kammer, das tät er und schickt nach dem König von Irland und den König von Cornwall und den anderen Fürsten und Freien, die aus seinem Königreich waren. Und da sie nun waren beieinander, da sprach der König zu ihnen die Wort, die der Graf von Richmond anhat, bracht von dem König Pontus, als von der Heirat zwischen meiner Tochter und Polydus. Und danach sprach er zu ihnen, Liebe Herren, ihr secht wohl, dass ich alt bin, und dass ich nimmer füg, Harnasch zu tragen, noch Unruh zu leiden, als ich vorhab getan, euch zu beschirmen, ob euch Not ankäme. 
Darum will ich meine Tochter verheiraten mit einem, der geschicket sei, euch zu behüten und aufzuenthalten in Leben und in Friede. Wann sollten wir nehmen, einen mächtigen Herrn als König oder Fürsten? Ich besorge, er wollt nur bleiben in seinem Lande und ihr müsstet sein ohne Hirten. Und steht einer dem anderen unter euch unbilligs und unrecht. So the fiction is uh, that he is importing somebody from abroad as uh, who hasn't a kind of Hausmacht uh, to take over and uh, to rule Britain in a kind of confederation, which is actually a, a German model of uh, rule rather than uh, a historic English uh, model or, or French. Um, <coughs> Darum bedunkt mich das Beste, ihr nehmt einen frommen, redlichen Ritter von hohem Stamm, der bei euch belieb, und der erkennte und verstünde, was er hätte, dass es von seinem Weib wäre. So, um, he thinks if the power comes through the female line, then he might be more considerate with his copiers. Und euch deste Bast dadurch geneiget wird, euch zu folgen. Und darum sprach er, ich mag euch wohl sagen, was man mit mir hat gerät. Da erläutert er ihn, wie König Pontus hat gerät, äh, mit dem Grafen von Richmond, von seiner Tochter, äh, Heirat mit seinem Vetter Polydas, den man hält für gar tugendlich und ist gar ein fürsichtig Mann und ein redlicher, frommer Ritter. So a kind of a cluster of uh, virtues, uh, which... Um, are praised for a ruler, but uh, in fact are more adjusted to a civic audience in Germany than uh, to uh, the inner narrative audience. Danach fingen sie an zu reden aus den Sachen von einem zu dem anderen, du lang von zu sagen wäre. So, uh, again, a shortening version we had seen in the Tristan. Aber am letzten sprachen sie alle einheitlichen, seine Tochter möchte nicht bass angelegt werden durch die Vorsorg uh, des, des Königreichs und euch am Nutzen wäre. Um, so, they send a messenger um, to... Uh, T uh, telling them that they want him. Ja, wann als lang sein Vetter Pontus lebt, so getan niemand, so keck sein, der uns Krieg getürre anbieten. Do der König hört, dass sie allwillig waren, er bat den König von Schotten und den Herzogin von Gloster, dass sie gingen zu Pontus und die Sache von ihm vernehmen und saget ihm, wir wollen seinen Vettern gern haben zu unserem Sohn. Danach gingen sie zu Pontus und redeten schöne mit ihm, und besonders wäre der König von England will ich mit seinen Freunden in den Sachen, nach denen ähm, und er es am ersten gemeldet hätte und anbracht. Ähm, den Grafen von äh, Rochmund. Pontus, so how to react to something like that, Pontus danket ihn gar demütiglichen, dem König und auch den anderen Königen, allen, die Freund waren und sprach, sie beweiseten ihm große Ehre und bat Gott, den Allmächtigen, dass er es ließ, um sie verschulden. So, there's always this uh, um, uh, pious um, element coming in. And um, so the royal marriage uh, comes and um, danach do ein Bootmann dem Erzbischof von Kandelberg. So, what is Kandelberg? Any idea? Canterbury, Canterbury exactly. Um, but uh, made into a kind of German <laughs> place name that is more um, and, uh, as a uh, Berg as uh, the normal uh, place ending for uh, a German towns. Um, so uh, as uh, you'll see next year, uh, still the... Uh, role of the Archbishop of uh, Canterbury to marry off um, English. Uh, no, no, he will marry, uh, he will crown Charles. Uh, he has married in, him enough. Uh, anyway. Um, Nun ist nicht zu fragen, ob Genefe groß freut hätte, 
wiewohl sie nicht desgleichen tät, wann sie hätt ihn lieb und lobet ihn von wegen seiner Hübschheit und Frümmkeit und auch von seines Vetters wegen. So there are three elements. And the word Hübschheit is a very interesting one. It's um, a, a linked to two new High German words. One is hübsch and the other is höfisch. So it's a courtliness uh, that uh, is both um, uh, inherited, but it's also um, a, a good looking uh, at the same time. So hübschheit und frümmkeit covers most uh, bases because frümmkeit uh, means both like modern German from being pious, but it also means like middle high German from being valiant and um, bold. So uh, two words with which to cover a lot of uh, different virtues. Um, and then um, the illuminated manuscripts ends uh with a as a with a final battle pontus then goes to galicia and um fights uh, the last uh um son and you always have uh, the goodies entering from left and the uh, baddies with a scimitar um entering from the right uh while the Uh, printed version frames it differently. It doesn't end with a battle. Um, it ends um, uh, like a fairy tale um, and also like a pious story. Danach durchstoben sie mit großer Klag von allen ihren Untertanen. Aber es ist also Gestalt von dieser Welt leben, dass doch kein Mensch so frummer, so reicher, noch so hübscher, noch so mächtiger ist. Er muss von dieser Welt scheiden. Amen. Gedruckt und vollendet ist dies Büchlein, genannt Pontus in der kaiserlichen Stadt Augsburg, am Montage nach St. Bartholomäus, Tage des heiligen Zwölf Boten, nach Christi, unseres lieben Herrn, Gebot, 1400 und im 85. Jahre. So that's the second uh, edition I've been reading from. So that is uh, still a dating uh, in the kind of uh, following the church uh, calendar, but it brings together both uh, the imperial status of um, Augsburg uh, and uh, the uh, topic of Uh, a model life. So um, the printer managed really to, to craft a, a well-working vernacular narrative that covered both uh, the fashionable elements uh, with marriages, uh, uh, battles in new uh, armor, and also uh, nods uh, to living a good, pious life as every citizen in Augsburg could do. Next week, uh, we are jumping across to the Reformation period and another imperial town, Nürnberg, and we'll see by looking at uh, the Reformation dialogues of Hans Sachs how the power of vernacular printing and the um, establishment of certain conventions in printing are yet then used for, to further the Protestant Reformation. Thank you.